to get started. Welcome back. Back in December 2023, <laughs> we thought this was it. We were saying our, well, see you later. So there's no such word in Cree anyways that I know that, you know, says goodbye. There's never, ever goodbye, but we'll see you later. So we were saying our see you laters back in December, but here we are. We're back. A webinar Wednesdays with Can Do. Uh, looking forward to today, you know, this is all about sh sharing knowledge from the guest speaker. So today we have Miranda joining us. We're delighted that you are here, but it's really about capacity building. It's really about learning. How do we, how can we do our, our jobs better? How can we, you know, build for our communities, our organizations, our nations, uh, perhaps personal professional development. So welcome. It's our first webinar on Wednesday of the year. And let me tell you, I am joining, I'm joining from uh, Miskwichi, Wiskagan, Edmonton, Treaty 6 territory. Uh, and it is a, like spring outdoors. Like last week, we were hit with some seriously cold weather, like winter mm. was upon us minus 40s and today I think we're in the plus like I think plus three uh, it feels like a spring day out there what's happening with this weather uh, so we give thanks to creator for whatever the day brings us and today we got the sun is shining in our corner of creator's world it's gorgeous outside um and, you know, there's a goodness all around us each and every day. So I hope you were able to take a moment just to take in, to extend gratitude for whatever goodness that you see in your world. So welcome, welcome. We're honored you're here. My name's Michelle. I um, am really honored to introduce our next guest speaker as she is going to talk about leadership and influence. Now we have sessions on Tuesdays and Innovate BC. And yesterday we talked about mentorship. And I think that that is a really important topic. And I didn't know this little fun fact that January is actually mentor month. I didn't know that. So I found that that little piece of knowledge really helpful. So I made sure I connected with my mentors in my world to give them thanks for what they have brought into my life. So I, I feel like mentorship and leadership are all, all in the same vein. So I think that this topic also is a very important one. So Miranda, thank you so much for being here. She is from Little Pine First Nation in Saskatchewan. Uh, a fellow Saskatchewan gal, a fellow Saskatchewan Esquio like me. Um, her name in Cree, so I'm going to let her tell, to speak her name in Cree, but it means women who, a woman who sits with the rocks. What a powerful name. So she, a little bit about our guest speaker today. She attended the University of Saskatchewan, holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree in Human Resource Management, has over 20 years of combined experience and social work, human resources, and project management. So her upbeat attitude, great communication skills, and extensive background in handling complex issues makes her a valuable resource for First Nations communities. And that's so true. She's been with us a couple of times previously with um, different workshops, different knowledge sharing. So it's great to have you here taking us on that journey of leadership and influence, a conversation that's so important. Uh, leadership development is so important. So thank you for being with us. And I'm going to pass this virtual mic off to you. If there's any questions along the way for all of you who've joined us, feel free to put in the chat box. I will make note there will, will, will be some time for any questions or connections, comments you know, after her presentation. So thank you all for being here. I'm Miranda, I'm passing this virtual mic off to you, you powerful Esquio. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak. And welcome all the participants that are attending my workshop today. 
And the topic that you've all been waiting for is uh, leadership and influence. And interestingly enough, mentorship, partnership, leadership, they all sound the same and leadership overall is part of that, okay? So let's get started. So again, welcome. Um, one of the things that we all know, this is a common, this is something that's commonly said. They say that leaders are born, not made. While it is true that some people are born leaders, some leaders are born in the midst of adversity. So in here, people who have never had a leadership role will stand up and take the lead when a situation they care about requires it. So some examples could be like parenting. You may not know it, but you have to have some sort of leadership skills when you are becoming a parent or you learn them over time, right? So when a child arrives, many parents discover leadership abilities when they ne never knew existed in order to guide and protect their offspring. There are also countless war stories of uh, soldiers or sailors who rose to the challenge on their own in the heat of battle. So clearly, leadership potential exists within each of us. That potential can be triggered by outside events, or it can be learned by exploring ourselves from within. So this training is going to take that approach. So once you learn the techniques of true leadership, you will be able to build the confidence it takes to, to lead. The more experience you have as a genuine leader, the easier it will be for you. It is never easy to take the lead as you will need to make decisions and face challenges, but it can become natural and rewarding. Okay, so this is what we're gonna cover today. We're going to define leadership and then look at some of the leadership styles. And then what? how do you inspire others, right? So inspiring a shared vision and then later on throughout the um, the workshop, we're going to look at how you how celebrating your accomplishments really helps. Like I do, every time I take a course, I successfully pass or I get a a promotion. Right, I'm always celebrating, and I go for lunch or dinner with my family and friends, and that's part of it. Right? Okay. So the evolution of leadership. Leadership itself has not evolved, but our understanding of it has. It is important to understand why very different leadership styles can be effective. Why the same leadership techniques will not work in every situation in which leadership style fits your personality best. So as long as there has been leaders, there have been those who try to determine how and why they are successful. Leadership itself has not evolved, but you as a person, when you um, gain knowledge, experience, you continue to learn and evolve, and your leadership skills are heightened, if, you know, if, if that makes sense, right? So everyone has leadership potential within them, but the under, but understanding these concepts that we're going to cover will help you maximize your leadership ability. Okay, so let's define leadership. Simply speaking, leadership is defined as the ability to lead. A better definition would be the capacity to establish direction and to influence and align others towards a common goal, motivating and committing them to action and making them responsible for their performance. Although this is more descriptive, it does not tell us what leadership actually is, but rather what it does. So when you define leadership, right, you're establishing direction. So 
you, you would have to have a vision. What is your vision? Most people want to know, know that, right? You need to have influence. You need to be able to motivate others. And you too need to be responsible as a, as a leader. And some of the characteristics are outlined here. The mark of a true leader is not a position or title held, but it is how many people are willing to follow, like follow you, right? A leader, you when people look at you as a leader, people know you, they like you, they follow you, right? You don't have to be a chief, you don't have to be a CEO, but people look to you as, as some sort of leader, right? So these are the following leadership characteristics that were ad identified in a study that I will show you in the next slide. But these were some of the characteristics in that survey people said a leader must possess, right? So honesty, they need to be competent, forward-looking, they need to be inspiring, intelligent, they need to be fair, courageous, straightforward, and imaginative. So these were the top uh, characteristics of a leader that that survey said a, a person should have, okay? So we'll look at situational leadership. Not everyone is on the same intellectual maturity, compliance, or at a motivational level, right? We all differ. Different people are motivated by different things, and this must be taken into account if one is to be a great leader. Communication experts consider it critical to tailor your message to your par target audience. It is the followers that you want to motivate and influence. You cannot do that if you do not know whom you are trying to motivate or influence. So if we look at this slide, the situational leadership model addresses four types of leadership styles. So based on the following, you have number one, telling, selling, participating, and delegating. So those are the four that I wanted to introduce you to. So let's look at the first one. So if we look at telling, telling is the newest level of leadership style. Most new employees require direct instructions. So this is called the telling or directing style. The follower is characterized by low competence and high commitment being unable to comply with possible feelings of insecurity. The leader must focus highly on tasks rather than a relationship with the employee as relationship does not exist yet at this time, right? When an employee can't do the job because they are unknowledgeable, the leader must spend much more time working with the employee offering clear instructions and regular follow-up. The leader must be encouraging and motivational, offering praise for positive results and correction for less than positive results. The idea is to motivate the follower to rise to the next level of ability. So this one here is a very leader-driven state. So these are all your new employees, all new, new employees. I was young once. I didn't have a lot of skills or knowledge. And when I started working, it was at McDonald's, right? So my leader, my supervisor pretty much had to show me how to do things, right? And then you just kind of move up the level as you, as you get to know, you know, your station. So this one is telling or directing, right? So your supervisor pretty much is giving you instructions on how to perform or do your job, right? It's very task focused, right? 
So eventually I graduated to the drive through right? After I was able to do, you know, make the fries, make the burgers and whatnot, right? They kind of move you down the line. And eventually I, you know, graduated to just taking drive through orders. So this would be more like, like a situation of where um, my supervisor's telling me how to do things, okay? So next would be selling. This is also task focused. And here in this situation, now you're, you're developing a relationship with um, the people that you're mentoring, right? And you're trying to build trust. So selling addresses the follower who has developed some competence with an improved commitment. The follower is not convinced yet but is open to becoming cooperative and motivated. The leader must still focus highly on tasks and this still requires much of the leader's time. But the focus now also includes developing a relationship with the employee, build upon trust that has begun to develop and the encouragement that has been demonstrated. The leader must spend more time listening offering advice, scheduling the follower, follower for additional training if the situation requires it. So here it could be um, maybe you are, you're a cashier or a cashier supervisor, maybe security, right? So you're focused on a task and you're developing your skills that you're going but in order for you to be good at what you're doing, there's got to be some sort of relationship between you and your supervisor, right? So that um, you're building trust so that they know you can do the job. So if you're a cashier, then your supervisor would be a cashier supervisor and there's a relationship there. Or maybe you're the cashier supervisor and you have to have that relationship with the retail store manager. You know, that type of, um, this is that situation, right? Selling, okay? The next one is participating. So here you have competent followers. There's less follow-up. So now you have people that are competent. They know what they're doing. They know the job and it's relationship focused. So participating addresses the follower who is now competent at the job, but remains somewhat inconsistent and is not yet fully committed. The follower may be uncooperative or performing as little work as possible. Sometimes that can happen, right? Despite their, you know, the fact that they're competent with completing tasks. The leader must participate and support follower. The leader no longer needs to give detailed instructions and how um, or how often, but does need to continue working with the follower to ensure the work is being done at the level required. The follower is now highly competent, but is not yet convinced in his or her ability or not fully committed to do their best and excel. So the leader must now focus less on the task assigned and more on the relationship between the follower, the leader, and the group. So this one here is a very follower-driven relationship and it's very focused, right? So in, in some industries or uh, work environments, you may be at the participating stage, but from time to time you need your uh, leader to, to follow up or encourage you or motivate you, even though you may know the job, you know, you still need that relationship with your boss. You know, maybe there's deadlines, things like that. Right, so this is the participating one where where your leader is actually helping you and encouraging you and motivating you 
but uh, but you're also competent. So there's also that other side where the leader uh, doesn't have to follow up all the time and oversee what you're doing. So there's both of those in this situation, right? Just like myself, I have a jobs grant manager and admin assistant. All I have to do is delegate tasks. They're very competent and they get them done. Right. I don't have to follow up all the time with what they were doing, what they're doing, but they keep me abreast of what's going on. So for them in my staff, right, they're very competent. They trust me. They like what I do and, and they support me and they, they've stuck with me for four years now. So obviously, you know, I'm inspiring them and influencing them to do really good and get good at their jobs where I don't have to oversee everything they do, okay? And then the next one is delegating, same thing, right? So you're empowering your follower. There's minimal, if supervision and you're praising good performance so with delegating so if you're the ceo or um, executive director and you have managers right so here your managers know their roles responsibilities their departments that they're responsible for you know oftentimes there's minimal supervision there's probably follow-ups, reports, you know, presentations that have to be done, uh, maybe monthly meetings, because that's what we do. We have a system where once a week we're sitting down with our staff, you know, going over what tasks need to be done, what are completed, what do we need to work on next, right? And then we have monthly managers meetings where we're, we're going over, we have an agenda, we know what it is that we have to talk about each month. Maybe it's new staff uh, coming in, maybe there's staff leaving, maybe there's people on sick leave, medical leave. We talk about these things, operations, right? Budgets, there's, a, there's things that we need to talk about each month. And then maybe there's quarterly meetings with staff. Maybe there's presentations that have to be done on policies that maybe staff still aren't, you know, complying to or didn't know, right? Oftentimes staff will say, well, I didn't know, right? So going over your policies on a quarterly basis is going to help them get there. Even training and development, those are all the things we talk about during our um, monthly managers meetings, our quarterly meetings with staff, and then we have AGMs, right, where we, we meet annually to talk about our strategic plan. So where are we? Where do we need to go? We have yearly, what, first year, second year, all the way to the fifth year, and some are 10 year goals, right? Where operation wise, where do we need to go? So as a leader, right, these are things that um, you do, and then these are things how you influence people to follow your vision. So usually what we do is we let our staff know what is our vision and mission for Okama? What are those? We go through that. Where are we now? Where do we need to go when we want to amplify business, right? This is where we're at. This is where we want to go. These are the people we want to reach and we go from there, right? So you're, you people know what people listen, they're inspired and they're influenced when you, when people are, are know what's going on. The more information you give and share and communicate with your staff helps you get there. People feel empowered and they want to follow you, and they believe in your vision and your mission, and, and they help you get there, right? So delegating is the ultimate goal. A follower who feels fully empowered and competent enough to take the ball and run with it with minimal supervision, follower is highly competent, highly committed, motivated, and empowered. The leader can now delegate tasks to the follower and observe with minimal follow-up, knowing that acceptable 
or even excellent results will be achieved. There is a low focus on class and a low focus on the relationship, right? Because you've worked so hard and together you have this, you know, trusting relationship that you don't have to hover over um, micromanage your staff because you've, you've lifted them up, you've empowered them, you've trained them to the point where they know how to run the business, right? There's no need, you know, to always compliment the, the uh, follower on every task like I did with, with uh, McDonald's when I started there. You know, your leader was constantly praising you. Good job, good job, Miranda. Now we're going to move on to this, right? So uh, when you get here, although um, you are still going to continue praising your outstanding performers, uh, you're going to do that. You must do that, you know, when it's appropriate, right? Because people uh, like being praised and people do like to be supervised, even though, you, you know, we say you, don't, you need very minimal supervision, doing check-ins, right? They really like that you're paying attention, that you're involved, that they can communicate with you, that they can reach you, right? So for me, they can text me, they can call me, they can get me on Teams, you know, they, they just, and they see my schedule, they have access to it. So if they're going to book meetings with me, whether it's a Ju uh, on Zoom or Teams, they know how I am how we work together, if they want to book me with a, uh, a community, right? Say, oh, this community is trying to get a hold of you, Miranda. We need to set up a meeting with them. They want to talk to you about their staff retreat. They need us to come out. So, and, and I'm like, yeah, go ahead, book, right? Just check my calendar. That's how much I trust them. And I know they're going to do the work because they've been trained really good and one day when they want to have their own business, they know the ropes. They know what they're doing. They know what's required of them should they ever want to start their own consulting business, right? Because they've been with us for four years. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you to two authors. Kaus, I think that's how you say it, and Posner. And so... These two authors wrote a book and it and asked a th thousands of people to rank a list of characteristics associated with leadership, including the seven top qualities that motivated them to follow winningly. So earlier I did tell you we're going to talk about them in this survey, right? They gave this survey to over 75,000 people over a 20 year period. So this book is called The Leadership Challenge, right? This, if you're interested, you know, go and get the book, right? The authors identified five abilities that were crucial to successful leadership. So in here, so model the way was one, you must lead by example, you can come into work 10 minutes late every day if you want your employees to arrive on time. The next one is inspire a shared vision, right? If you capture the imagination, you will inspire creative, thoughtful, and increase loyal uh, followers. The vision doesn't need to be grandiose but it needs to be communicated effectively for others to adopt it as one of their own. So one of the things I like to do is travel. I like to say I'm a world traveler. So when I want ladies to travel and see the world because it'll change them, right? It's life changing, you know, and, and I say, come with me or I post a, a trip, you know, I'm inspiring them. I'm sharing my vision and they follow, right? Then we all have people, women that want to go where I want to go, that kind of thing, okay? So challenge the process. Don't continue doing something just because we've always done it that way. 
situations change and sometimes a policy or procedure never well worked well in the first place, think outside the box, right? Challenge the process was another. The next one, enable others to act. Truly empower people to act on their own within their, their level of authority. The famed Ritz-Carlton Hotel empowers every employee at all levels to spend up to a thousand on behalf of a guest who is, info is informed reimbursement will be required for whatever request they make. So apparently uh, at this really uh, ritzy hotel, they empower their staff to uh, spend up to a thousand dollars you know, on, on guests that uh, come to their hotel, right? So enabling others to act is another one. So empowering people to act on their own. The other one is encourage the heart. A positive attitude is infectious. If the leader appears passionate or excited about the vision, Others will catch the enthusiasm as well. So, you know, when you, just like a smile, it's, it's infectious, right? So when you smile, somebody will smile. If you wave, they wave. And there's that thing on the reserve when you're driving, you're giving the peace sign, they'll give the peace sign, you know, you know, it's that kind of thing, right? So being positive and encouraging and uh, smiling is, is just, one is the probably the most simplest, you know, greeting that that people. If you smile, they smile, right? So leaders um, appear passionate or excited, and that's an enthusiastic, you know. So anyway, in these books, there's a number of books here, and and these authors wrote on each one of them. So there's there's five in total. Modeling the way, inspiring a shared vision, challenge the process, enable others to act, and encourage the heart. Right, but this was their first book that they wrote, and then these came after they've done all those surveys and examined what what it is that people you know wanted to share with them. So they wrote books on them. Okay, so the results of that book or that study with the most important quality was at the top. So in that book, in the survey with all those people, they said number one was honesty. You know, as a leader, honesty was rated number one. And then forward looking was the next. They had to be competent, inspiring, intelligent, all those ones we, we talked about earlier, those are all the ones they listed. And, but these would be, are the top, right? Honesty, that they're cooperative, that they're determined, inspiring, and loyal. So these came as the top when it came to leadership skills and development. But when we talked earlier, there was a whole list you know, of, of qualities, of characteristics that they said a leader needed to have, okay? So I encourage you to do that personal inventory. As a leader, do you have all these qualities? You probably do, right? Okay, so here now that you understand the various leadership concepts, it's time to plan how to put them into action by incorporating them into your life. So first, set leadership goals. In leadership, as in life, you will never come to the end of your learning. You're always learning, growing, but you wanna rank it in priority order those qualities you want to develop, right? So uh, so even like for me, right? Because I grew up, you know, poor, like most of us, maybe some of us grew up in alcoholic homes, which I did, right? 
and didn't have anybody in my family that graduated from high school, let alone university, right? It was challenging to grow up like that. But as I, as I understood, you know, residential school, intergenerational trauma, as I went to school and learned what affected our families, I realized, okay, I need some healing. I need to learn what motivates Miranda. What, what is it? What are some of the qualities that I needed to develop, even my personality, right? I changed over time. It took me a long time to get where I was at, but I had to take a, I had to set goals and I had to work on my weaknesses, right? My flaws. What are things that were stopping me from getting ahead, right? And those, you do a checklist, write down some of those things, those qualities that you want to develop, right? And public speaking was never something I could do. I was very timid. I was very self-conscious, right? I couldn't even public speak without my voice just shaking out of fear that I was going to be judged, laughed at. Today now, I developed that. I overcame my fear and those things don't even bother me anymore. But it took me a while to get over that. But I developed those skills. That's what I'm talking about, right? So address the goals. Determine how you will accomplish your goals. So how are you going to get there? Do you feel you need to learn more about teamwork? You know, because some people can't function uh, in teams. They work alone. They can't people, right? They can't do people, right? Maybe they're introverts, and that could be the reason why. So, and how are you supposed to lead a team? You know, when when you're you have those personality traits. So just kind of knowing yourself is really going to help you, right? What is it you need to work on? And maybe you need to join a team sport, you know, to get you out of that. For me, it was karaoke singing. You know, at first I took, um, uh, what do you call that? Public speaking. Uh, I took a uh, public speaking classes, me and two of my friends, and to try and you know, get rid of that fear, but it, that didn't even help, right? Because you're you're judged how to speak if you're going um um um. They count all those, so even that I felt very self conscious going to. But what helped me was karaoke singing, right? That helped me. Once I started karaoke singing, and practicing and getting better, got me over my my insecurities my shaking, my stress, uh, you know, I just couldn't public speak before. But what helped me was in sports, because I was not good in sports, but it was the singing. The singing is what helped me. So you got to know, you know, what it, what's going to work for you, because it's not the same for every everybody. Do you want to communicate better? Take a creative writing class, right? And my writing improved. I had to practice my writing skills. I could write, but I wasn't a good writer. I found the more I wrote, I became better. Even the structure, learning all that. Now I can say I'm a good writer. I can write curriculum. I can public speak. I can develop uh, training workshops, right? You know, you, how, no one would ever think that I could do that a long time ago, right? So taking a writing classes, Toastmasters, joining Toastmasters, that's what I took to help. But even then I felt nervous because I was being judged on how I was presenting and how I was speaking. And, you know, it was still nerve wracking. And then so... Um, and then maybe getting some public speaking experience might help you. But Toastmasters are also great if you are shy and want to feel more comfortable in social situations. For me, it worked a, li a, a bit, but not totally. Like what I got from Toastmasters was to be able to read scripts, how to time myself, 
to pay attention to the arms, like things like that. I, I, I would say Toastmasters did help me that way. Okay. So it, it did help. And then the karaoke singing really excelled, you know, uh, make me, made me feel more comfortable, you know, and confident. Um, and I sang in front of my friends who would encourage me, yeah, go, go sing, you know, just try it. And oh my God, once I did it, I didn't realize how easy and fun it was. See? All right, the next one, seek inspiration. Learn about a variety of leaders, including their styles with dealing with challenges. Read books and maybe videos. Do research on the internet or go to the library, right? So you're, you're wanting to seek inspiration so that you want to become a better leader. I really like um, Oprah. I like listening to Denzel Washington. I like Joe, listening to Joel Osteen and his sermons, right? For me, I like listening to, to those people, but there's more. Maybe you have people that... Um, you like listening to, you know, I, I go on YouTube when I want to feel motivated, and inspired, you know, Oprah helps me there. Um, so is, so does um, that uh, president, you know, from the United States, Obama. I like listening to him, his wife, you know, I'm always doing research. I'm always looking for inspiration, right? How can I get better? Right, the next one is choose a role model. So based on your research, choose a role model that fits your personality. You might choose a dynamic leader or an intellectual leader, right? Or someone like Albert Einstein, right? People like that, but you know, but read several biographies, books, and find videos on his or her, her life. I even have a book on Michelle Obama. I wanted to learn about her, Oprah. You know, they're they're black people who, you know, they're they're they've gone through what we went through, but maybe worse. And yes, sometimes worse. So how did they get over that era? Right? So I like reading stuff like that. If they can do it, I can do it too, right? The other one, seek experience, take a leadership role in a social group or club, gain experience working with people on many levels. So for here, when I was in university, you know, I uh, ran for the president of the Aboriginal Business Student Society and I got it. People believed in me, what I was doing. I became the president. I didn't think I'd do it. I just wanted to, I was, you know, I knew they were looking for um, members. I ran and I became the president, you know, one year. So the next one, create a personal mission statement. Imagine your legacy. How would you want to be remembered? What do you want people to think of when they think about you? What type of leader you uh, do, do you determine to be? Write a statement that I, that defines who will you become, right? So write a personal mission statement, right? That that helps too. So creating your action plan involves all these points that we went through. Okay, now modeling the way. Remember that the best leaders are examples of what they want their followers to be. By definition, a leader is in the lead right up front, ready to take the heat if something goes wrong. If something does go wrong, a true leader never blames his or her followers, even if in fact they fail. A true leader takes the blame and then addresses how do we fix it? How do we correct the problems that we just failed, right? That's what a leader does modeling the way. So leadership is neither for the timid nor for the arrogant. Confidence is often resented or misinterpreted for arrogance. People who lack self-confidence often feel intimidated by a true leader. 
This should never hold you back. If you have honesty, integrity, and deal with everyone fairly, then others will see that. Be willing to uh, listen to criticism, but also consider the source. If you are too afraid of what others might say about you, or you ignore legitimate complaints, insisting on respect solely because of your position, you will lose the respect and cooperation of your followers and peers. So there's, um, there's this quote here that uh, President Theodore Roosevelt said best. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is not effort without error and shortcomings, but who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he falls while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. You may have heard that perception is reality. You must always present an honest, caring, dedicated attitude to inspire others. To inspire loyalty, you must have a track record of honesty and fairness. If any of your followers don't do feel they have been wrong for whatever reason, you need to address the issue immediately. People talk and a problem ignored is a problem that grows. Believe it or not, the most powerful influence you can have is often not trying to influence somebody. When people believe you are open to their suggestions and believe they have been heard, they will work harder even if they disagree with the methods or the goals. That is the power of listening. Simply listening to others makes them feel empowered, even if you don't accept their suggestions. If a follower feels there's no point talking to you, they won't, and they will disengage themselves from your vision and will only follow your directions grudgingly. If you are seen as going the extra mile, your followers are more likely to go the extra mile too. If you hide in your office and people never see you, you will be perceived as out of the loop, uninformed, uninterested, and therefore unworthy to lead. Many successful corporate executives make it a point to be seen by their employees every day. If an employee is to be commended for something, it is done publicly often right in the middle of their workplace while they are surrounded by their coworkers. It sends a powerful message to everyone. The key to true leadership is to inspire a shared vision among your followers. Before you can convey a vision, however, you have to develop it. You must be clear with your vision live it before others can see it and model it in your behavior. What do you want to accomplish and what do you need to do to get there? Determine attainable goals and focus on them. King Arthur sought the Holy Grail. Lewis and Clark mapped much of the United States. NASA took us to the moon. What is your vision? 
your vision will provide a sense of direction for you and your followers. In the military, focus is on the mission. Whatever the mission is, everyone is dedicated to it. Let your vision be like a lighthouse on a hill, guiding ships to safely and warning them away from the rocks. Communication is more than just the words you say or the memos you write. Remember, actions speak louder than words. Take every opportunity to communicate your vision in words and deeds. One of the best ways to communicate a vision is to sum it up in a simple catch phrase. Post your slogan, catch phrase, and mission statement in prominent locations. When you send out emails listed in quotes below your signature block, hold meetings occasionally or hand out visionary awards to people who exemplify your vision. Above all, lead by example. Far too often we cling to what is familiar, even if what we cling to is known to be inadequate. Most large groups are governed by the law of inertia. If it takes effort to change something, nothing will change. As a leader, you must search out opportunities to change, grow, innovate, and improve. There is no reward without risk. However, you must be willing to experiment, take risks, and learn from any mistakes. Ask questions if you, even if you fear the answers. Start with the questions why. Why are things the way they are? Why do we do things the way we do? Question things. To lobby for change, you need to influence people and excite them to your vision. You may need to persuade a reluctant boss or fight a corporate culture that doesn't understand what you are trying to do. In that case, you need to demonstrate why your requested change needs to occur. Do your research and always enter a meeting by being prepared. Study the situation and present all your findings in a short report, preferably with simple charts or maybe you want to use graphs. Give them something they can easily understand. Have the details ready in case you are asked a question, but don't overload people with facts. Show as clearly as possible how your plan will affect positive change. A positive attitude is also essential to encouragement. No one likes to fail and many take it very personally. While failure should never be rewarded, while failure should never be rewarded, an understanding attitude and positive outlook can work wonders. A child only learns to walk by, by falling down many times, right? We heard that. We heard that saying, the focus is not on the fall, but on getting up. The goal is to walk, then run. Meeting with, a, with an employee one-on-one -on -one is important to positively, positively motivate them. Here again, you must use the power of listening. Avoid blame when something goes wrong and focus on the reason for the failure. You may learn someone needs more training, more self-confidence, or more freedom. You may learn someone does not have the tools needed to be successful. You will never know if you don't ask questions and listen. Or worse, if you, de if you put someone down for failing, that's the worst, right? If someone is will willfully defiant, then feel free to be stern and resolute. Take disciplinary action if necessary and document the conversation. If you allow someone to be defiant or lazy out of a misplaced concern for his or her feelings, you will be performing a great injustice against the rest who are working hard. 
in most cases, people really do want to do a good job and they have a sense of pride when they meet the challenge. You will never be worthy of respect if you don't give respect. Respect should be given to everyone at all levels unless they de deliberately do something to lose that respect. You need to build respect in other ways as well. Be visible to your followers, show them you are available and interested in knowing everything about what they do. Develop and demonstrate your knowledge of the organization and details of the product or service or operation. If you are perceived as being knowledgeable and can answer questions, you will not only earn respect, but you will motivate others to learn as well. Respect leads to trust. You do what you say and say what you mean. Under promise and over deliver can help manage expectations. If you are given a task you know will take that will take you one hour, say, should have it done in two hours. You never know when you'll, you'll get a phone call that eats into your time or when an emergency may pop up. If you get done in less than two hours, you will be perceived as a hero. If not, you can call and apologize. It will be done a little later without much trouble because you said you would have it done. You didn't promise that you would have it done. If people feel they, they can rely on you, they will trust you. Also, let people know that you are not asking them to do anything you would not do yourself or have done in the past. Work hard and be seen working hard. If you come in early and see others uh, who are there early as well, Stop and simply mention that fact positively. A nice greeting, a nice positive greeting. A simple word of recognition will go a long way to earning respect. Without respect, you will never have loyalty. And without loyalty, you can't trust your followers. Without mutual res trust and respect, you can't, you cannot accomplish great things. Remember, while your people need to be able to trust you, you need to build them up to the level where you can also trust them. If your followers are going to share in the work, make certain they, are, they share in the rewards. If you are going to get a bonus for a successful task, share it at least a portion of it with your followers or take them out you know, for lunch, celebrate, right? More than one employee has felt betrayed by leadership when the boss gets a big bonus or reward and those who, who did all the work get nothing. You don't need to give them anything, you know, or divide it up or anything like that. We're not saying that, but you should at least, you know, you know, have some sort of celebration, whether it's, you know, maybe a little party, Maybe it's a lunch or and, and showing them some credit that you you they all share in in your success, right? Or maybe you want to give a pair of movie tickets or maybe lottery tickets, for example, right? Giving them something, you know, because you know you didn't just receive that award or that bonus on your own. In some way, your staff has helped you to get there, but do something to show they didn't work hard for nothing and that you're taking all the credit. Set both personal and team goals and milestones. Nothing motivates someone like public recognition. Although some may seem somewhat embarrassed by a public display, Inside, they are proud they have been recognized. There has never been a recorded study that quotes an employee who has, was honored in public with them saying that they never wanted that to happen again. Celebrate team milestones as well. 
It breaks up the routine of the workday, gives a well-deserved break, and motivates people to work harder when they return to work refreshed. You don't need to decorate the office each day or have morning pep rallies. The workplace should never be dreaded by employees. People spend most of their waking lives at work with substantially less time for family, friends, and activities they would much rather be doing. By the very definition, they come to work and you have to pay them to be there. People have to feel motivated by more than just a paycheck. Be sure to have welcoming a welcoming environment where people feel respected, celebrate special occasions to break up the routine, but don't make celebration itself the routine of no or no work will get done. The best leaders are able to influence others to do something and think it was all their idea. Don't worry about taking credit for every good thing that happens on your watch. As the leader, you get credit whenever your followers succeed because you created the environment that allowed their success. Aristotle was a master of the art of persuasion and he outlines his thinking in his work where he identifies three important factors, ethos, pathos, and legos. Ethos persuades people using character. If you are respectful and honest, people will be more likely to follow you because of your character. Your character convinces the follower that you are someone who is worth listening to for advice. And then there's pathos, it's the emotional side. Persuades people by appealing to their emotions. For example, when a politician wants to gain support for a bill, it, 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 it is argued. It is for the children. Babies, puppies, and kittens abound in advertising for a reason. Although a car is neither male nor female, they are sometimes called sexy in car commercials. Pathos allows you to tie into emotional triggers that will capture a person's attention and list their support, but it can be easily abused, right? Leading to a loss of ethos as described above. And then there's logos, logical, persuades people by means persuading by appealing to their intellect. This was Aristotle's favorite in his forte, but not everyone reacts on a rational level. Of the three, ethos must always come first. Ideally, you want to appeal to pathos, back your arguments up with logos, and never lose ethos, right? It's confusing. But President Bill Clinton appealed to people using pathos, saying, I feel your pain. But there were serious questions raised about his ethos, and he often did not back up his appeals with logos. There is no doubt that he was a successful person, but there is also no doubt that he was not as successful as he could have been. Okay. A vision without specific targeted goals is just a wish or a hope. Without targeted goals, how will you ever know if your vision is being accomplished? A vision needs a project, a roadmap with milestones, but how do you determine what those goals are? First, we will discuss goals themselves and how to determine what your goals should be and how to support them. So setting goals is so important. So you know where you're starting and where what it is you want to do and then creating a, a plan, a roadmap on how you're going to get there. So, you know, creating a long-term plan requires you to do some strategic planning. And I have said that earlier. So strategic planning is uh, long-term plans. It is the roadmap that guides you to the ultimate realization of your vision. 
as discussed previously, a goal may be possible, but not attainable or realistic. You may be missing a quality person for a key position, for example. You may lack the funds, you know, for a project or time to achieve a higher level goal. So lower level stepping stone goals must be planned, right? So creating a long-term plan requires a lot of thought. So once your goals are established, you need a way to ensure they are set in motion. Duties must be assigned and documentation must be established to support and track your progress. And some people use a Gantt chart, if you're familiar with that. It's a great way to track milestones over a period of time. You need to establish the tools necessary to track progress or development as appropriate. These might include like simple checklists for some tasks and complicated advanced software maybe for others. Right? Monitoring and oversight are the key to achieving all goals, even like career goals, right? When, they, when you went to university and you're trying to go into a specific um, in, uh, like education, business, whatever, engineering, oftentimes they will ask you, what are your career goals? What are you trying to do? Why are you, you know, entering into this field? What do you hope to achieve, right? So they're, they're, they're wanting to know what it is you're trying to do. And then, the, and then when you have a career counselor, they're tracking your probes, right? They're tra track their and and they're helping you along if you need those supports. Okay, so the, to be a leader, you must first see yourself as a leader. Based on what you have learned so far, you now know what qualities are important in a leader, and you have prioritized them as they apply to you. Experience is the greatest teacher. However, there is no substitute. If you ever had a boss that infuriated you and made you want to quit your job, you know what you don't want to be like. If you ever had a parent, teacher, coach, or supervisor who inspired you, you have a good example to follow. And with that, I'm done, you know, my presentation. I'm open to questions if there's time, but I will leave it to, to the organizers if, if there's time for questions. Um, thanks, Miranda. Uh, we are actually 10 minutes over. Um, so I just put your email in the, um, in the little chat box there. If anyone has questions for Miranda, you can go ahead and email her as we are out of time. Um, but yeah, thank you for everybody for um, coming and we'll see you all next week. And thank you, Miranda. All right. We'll see you again next month. I think I'm back again. Yeah, she's back again next month. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. all. Right. See you guys. And thanks yeah. you. thank you for coming to my workshop.